sisters, brothers, friends, kindred in Christ, we gather on this Easter morning. Christ is risen. risen (laughs) Welcome to each of you, you who are here in person, you who are online, you who are regular attendees, you who are visitors. Glad that you are with us this morning. We gather with a hope and a promise that is revealed in the reality that the tomb is empty, that Christ is truly risen. As we gather in announcements, um, you probably have noticed that there are Easter eggs around. Um, If there are youth after worship, there will be an egg hunt. Um, but know that the eggs that are that you may find in the sanctuary are for you. Um, and it is not just a, we celebrate that there are Easter eggs that, of an Easter bunny of something pagan, but even in plastic eggs where you would not expect to find life, there are surprises. And that is part of the promise of Easter. A tomb is not where you expect to find life. And yet Christ is risen. And so I invite you, if you find an egg or want to search out an egg, there are ones to be found to be enjoyed. There are also a few peanut butter Easter eggs that are for sale um, with proceeds going to the Witness Fund. Um, So if you would like to have a peanut butter egg, you're welcome to to purchase one of the remaining ones there. Um, Nancy McCallion is dealing with um, problems with her sciatic nerve, um, and so is not able to be here. I am a poor substitute for her announcements, but would remind you that there is still soup, um, and please give items to the blessing box. Are there other pieces I'm missing? Pancake breakfast is next Saturday. I don't know if there's a sign-up sheet (laughs) yet. All right. Um, There is? There'll be a a sign-up sheet. I guess that can be sent out by email since it's next Saturday, um, this coming Saturday, the 15th. Um, That's our, will happen third Saturday of each month. So kind of keep that in mind for, for this month and future months. Are there other announcements? Since there's so many people here, I want to make a, pl- a play for uh, Mechanicsburg Ecumenical Choir, which I am a member of. Um, our concert is May 21st. It's a Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and it'll be at St. Joe's Catholic Church in Mechanicsburg. It's a free concert. Um, the music is really beautiful, um, and I'm, I'm going to pass some off to Richard because I think the choir could do some of it. Um, but it's some beautiful music, and there's a love offering taking up then for New Hope Ministries afterward. Um, I've put a p- poster out in the in the gathering area and put and I wrote on the bottom, Stacy is a member, so you know which one it is. All right, thank you. Thank you to all who purchased flowers to help decorate our sanctuary, and thank you to Linda who arranged them. Um, you're welcome to pick them up after worship. There is a, um, a sheet that says where to find them, correct? Most are up front. <laughs> yes, there is a sheet on the sign-up easel that indicates where the flowers will be. Thank you. <laughs> are there any other announcements? Then let us continue in a spirit of worship.
Those who are able, please stand with me for the call to worship. Whenever we, amidst the uncertainties of life, lift up our eyes and find the early dawn of hope to bless and reassure us, we know that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Whenever the midnight darkness of hostility and violence give way to the early dawn of compassion and caring, and in the strength of that emerging light, neighbor reaches out to neighbor in simple kindness, we know that Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Whenever the twilight of uncertainty makes us hesitate, or the feeling of being lost shrouds our spirits in tenacious darkness, may we hear in some early dawn of our souls a voice saying, Lo, I am always with you. And we know that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Whenever there are, appears to be every reason to say that the light around us seems to be darkness, yet neither misfortune nor mistake can put down the relentless dawn of joy and gladness in our souls, we know that Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Because we are among those who know what it is to live in the light of Easter's early dawn, because morning is broken anew this new day, we are glad to say, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let us pray. Resurrected God, you are the God of new beginnings, of new dawns and new mercies. Enter into our presence again. When we move toward the tomb, remind us that you come with life. When we despair at the world unfolding around us, Assure us of your redemptive power. When we long for your voice, speak a word of hope, encouragement, and peace. May we reflect your image as a resurrection people in covenant with you. Amen.
The scripture reading is from Acts 10, 34 through 43. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Peter began to speak. Oops, I was supposed to do an introduction. Sorry. You know I have to mess it up. It's what I do. Um, In Acts, Simon Peter is challenged to expand his understanding of God's message of good news through Christ. A vision of what and whom God has called clean leads him to go to the Gentiles, where he proclaims what Christ has done through his death and resurrection. Now, Acts 10, 34 through 43. Peter began to speak. I now realize that it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him, no matter what race he belongs to. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know of the great event that took place throughout the land of Israel, beginning in Galilee after John preached his message of baptism. You know about Jesus of Nazareth and how God poured out on him the Holy Spirit and power. He went everywhere, doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of everything that he did in the land of Israel and in Jerusalem. Then they put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the death three days later and caused him to appear, not to everyone, but only to the witnesses that God had already chosen, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from death. And he commanded us to preach the gospel to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets spoke about him, saying that everyone who believes in him will have his sins forgiven through the power of his name. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. It may be one of the most common phrases in the Bible. According to one author, 
some variation of do not be afraid is found 365 times, one for each day of the year, at least on on leap years. Others say that that's an exaggeration, but there are at least 100 times that it's found, which is still impressive. For myself, in doing some research, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible includes the exact phrase, do not be afraid, 57 times. 39 in the Hebrew Scriptures and 18 in the New Testament. NIV includes 61 times in the Hebrew Scriptures and 24 times. But in both versions and in all versions, some variation on this theme of not being afraid is found many more times. By the way, I didn't read through the entire Bible finding that. I have a concordance that helps me to to find that easily. So don't be too impressed. (laughs) Almost all of these words of admonition or comfort come from either God, from Christ, a prophet or angelic messenger. Even someone who can miss an obvious message, some of us are a little more dense than others, should take note that a cause to a call to release fear or to not be afraid is a core message in the Bible. It also tells me that biblical authors knew that fear is part of the human condition. Researchers say that Fear is both an innate and a learned response to stimuli. Innate fears, ones that we're born with, include a fear of falling, a fear of pain, and a fear of loud noises. Anyone who has ever been around an infant can probably recognize all three of those fear responses. As infants, our response to fear is to either cry or to withdraw, to seek comfort, or to be very silent, to hope to be ignored. Those gut feelings stay with us as we grow older, as we develop other fears. We know what fear feels like. Our hearts beat faster. We feel the temptation to to run, to fight, to hide, to freeze. Feel it in our guts. And as brave or courageous as we may be, each of us wrestles with fear. In our life of faith, the phrase appears in the Easter story. But we recognize it in other places as well. Even in the birth narratives, especially as told in Luke. In fact, there are a number of parallels between the birth stories and resurrection stories. Dennis Dewey, a pastor, actor, one of the original biblical storytellers in its current format, created a reading that goes back and forth between Luke's birth narrative and passion and resurrection. And he's given permission for me to use it. But as the book of Matthew has been our focus gospel this year, I've adapted it and expanded it to include part of Matthew's telling. So I invite you to listen for the parallels and listen especially for the places of fear and the places of comfort for fear. Now the birth of the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. 
chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge. So that the governor was greatly amazed. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. Now with the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And he named him Jesus, which means God saves. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered great, a great deal because of a dream about him. Pilate said to the crowd, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, let him be crucified. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Jerusalem of Judea, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is this Pilate who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star in the east, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. Then Pilate released Barabbas for the crowd, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. And the people stood by, watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was. 